focusing on growing it and they formed worker collectives and cooperatives that are taking care of each of these things and they've eliminated a lot of the capitalism internally and a lot of this is just based on a real true gift economy um, and it's through this like creation of what they need and the sharing amongst themselves that they've empowered themselves to basically disassociate from the state and disassociate from corporate capitalism and steward their own communities locally um, and so it's the lessons that I learned there that I want to see applied here and really ask the question of what is applicable here because the very different social climates and very different ecosystems like we're talking about. How large of a group is it? How many I mean, there's tens of thousands of Zapatistas all throughout Chiapas. Um, the town I was in was probably 600 people, um, but there's, you know, 20 to 40 towns in each municipality and then about 30 municipalities within the Junta de Buen Gobierno, the Caracol La Realidad, and that's one of five Caracols throughout Chiapas. So they're organized in this really large geographic scale, but in this really decentralized model that provides for local autonomy at each place. Yeah. For the benefit of Occupy, could you mention Magdaliano and Magdalena? Yeah, I can. Um, so um, May, can you tell me May 3rd, May 2nd? Um, on May 2nd, um, one of the teachers of the little school, um, a Zapatista named um, Compañero Galeano, was uh, shot and killed in Chiapas um, in the same caracol I've been speaking about, La Realidad, by what's being talked about in the mainstream media as a group called um, COAC Historica, um, and some people aligned with their local Green Party, which isn't like our Green Party here, it's not like the environmental thing, I mean, it kind of fronts as that, but it works closely with the PRI, which is the um, political party that's had power in Mexico for the last 100 years until very recently. And so it's being called like internal indigenous violence, um, you know, different groups attacking different groups. But the perspective that a lot of people have that have been doing solidarity work with the Zapatistas here in the Bay Area and a lot of what's being talked about globally is that this is the way that the state and the federal government operates is that they basically give things over to these local groups that they can't get other ways, um, cows, cattle, money, things like this, and they basically have them create this internal <coughs> violence so that it can't be blamed on the state and it can't be blamed on the government. So they use this like paramilitary model of um, working with organizations to create that kind of internal violence. And the story is unclear. Like, I have no idea what actually happened there. Um, all I know is that this Zapatista was killed. He was killed by a group that had come to the Caracol to do like some negotiations that included COAC Historica and the local Green Party and some other political parties. Um, but how much of that is actually is truly internal violence among indigenous communities in Chiapas and how much of it is you know, state-sponsored um, and government-manipulated violence is unclear and people have different opinions on that. Um, what is known is that this guy was like one of the main teachers of the Escuelita. Um, and so in the aftermath of this, um, Subcomandante Marcos, who's been like the spokesperson of the Zapatistas for the last 20 years, has stepped down and uh, basically abandoned that persona um, and uh, given light to the Subcomandante Galeano or spoken of this person who was killed down there. Um, COAC Historica is interesting because I actually visited their occupation in the city of San Cristobal, which is actually in like the urban center in the city limits in Chiapas, one of the biggest cities there. And they took over a piece of land that was owned by the um, uh, anthropo, it's like the indigenous anthropological museum or something like this. And they took over this piece of land about six years ago and started an occupation actually in the center of San Cristobal, where they, you know, built shacks and small houses and are starting to grow some amount of food, but basically have reclaimed access to land within the city. Um, and so there was, when I was researching that, I saw that there was already like some internal conflict that was happening between groups like COAC Historica and the Zapatistas and people like this. Uh, but this is kind of like the most violent that's ever gotten. And um, yeah, I mean, I guess I want to bring it back to like, that provides an opportunity to talk about these like 
inner city occupations that are happening in Chiapas as well. Like what is our ability here to reclaim access to land, to grow food, to reclaim, reclaim access to land, to house people, and to create community spaces? Like what is our potential in the Bay Area to be able to do, to learn lessons from what they've done there, which is basically create autonomy and create liberation and health through land access um, and being able to steward these, these areas of land in a way where they're creating for all their own needs and sustaining themselves well and therefore able to disassociate from the larger political institutions and corporate institutions and basically defend themselves as local communities. Um, so that's some of the work that we've been exploring for the last few years with these various actions that I've been talking about, but it hasn't really gotten to the point where they have, where they're like in a sustained long, long-term way really holding access to this land and uh, being able to create everything they need and sustain their own communities. And so I guess, I mean, that's one of my biggest questions, like what lessons can be learned from there and applied here and how can we create more local autonomy through land access and through creating our own food and through creating what we need for our own sustenance. So I'm curious to people's thoughts on that. Well, it's interesting, right, because, you know, like our, our definition of sustenance needs to be reworked in the first place, you know? Like if we want to talk about providing locally grown food for all San Franciscans, it's like you have to, there's so many factors that have to be taken into account, of course. You know, they estimate that the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula, there was maybe a couple of villages that that totaled about 150 people on this peninsula. And if, you know, if a society that has existed for thousands of years and sort of sussed out a relationship with the earth that is in some way sustainable, as you imagine indigenous communities of, you know, the North American continent often did, uh, that maybe 150 people is all that the San Francisco Peninsula can actually sustain if you want to do it in a way that's that's truly in line with you know su sustaining ecosystems as well, not only just humans, but then you know there are also <coughs> really optimistic and <coughs> studies coming out of places like UC Berkeley and other uh, universities around the country where they're they're looking at land mass, soil composition, urban populations, and they're doing these like complex uh, algorithms to try to figure out you know, how much space would it actually take in a city to feed mm -hmm. loads of people. And there have been some really awesome, interesting studies that have come out and said you could feed the current population of San Francisco based on like, uh, if you consider local, like a hundred mile radius or what have you um, of, of gardens and farms and so forth. But that all, you know, so all, I guess my thing is that all of these questions about like what does sustainability actually mean and what does sustainability actually look like are far more complicated than any one of us could ever answer and really take in a ton of factors that, that go from as local as like looking at your micro ecosystem that exists, whether you're in the Sunset District or the Bayview or you're in Berkeley or what have you, and the actual like ecological conditions of that place. Looking at you know what food plants grew there before this kind of you know more modern system of agriculture rose and lines and so forth took over, and what does that indicate about the landscape and how many people it can sustain? as well as like what will our communities actually look like and what kind of communities are we trying to sustain? Do we want, if UC Berkeley says, oh yeah, you can grow enough food for everybody in San Francisco if we put everybody into massive 200 foot tall high rises and then grow food in 200 foot tall hydroponic operations held in skyscrapers, which is totally, it's a serious option people are talking about, but is that, is that what we want? You know, if, if the numbers work, is that still the kind of society that we want to live in? So, the, so, you know, I think that in these projects, while we're engaging with, you know, taking over spaces and so forth, and I'm, I, I keep thinking about this metaphor, this permacultural metaphor, I guess, of like annual plants versus perennial plants. Like annuals have one season where they live and they die. Perennials like live out. So I'm thinking about these spaces 
these autonomous zones where we take over and try to test out different models for living differently. Some are going to be inherently temporary and are going to act like an annual where you'll get one harvest and it'll be this beautiful example of like a delicious tomato. And then some of them will be these long-lasting spaces that we really have to take a lot of care to tend. Um, but in all of these spaces, I think it's really important that we keep the question of the future and like what does the ideal future society look like in mind and also keep the landscape and what it looked like in the past and how it functioned in the past in mind too um, in order to not to both not be too idealistic nor too like pessimistic to find this like nice middle ground um, and that these conversations you know it's like people thought that just eating organic food was going to save them because it, for, for a long time, and now we find out, like, well, now suddenly people in Peru can't afford to eat their traditional quinoa because people in America think eating organic quinoa is, like, great for them and healthy and saving the environment. So it's, like, we constantly have to break down these givens of things that, like, sound nice and appear nice and so forth and actually look at, like, what are the in what is the impact of our action on the planet? What is the impact of our action on the people around us? what is going to be the impact of what we do to our children and their children and their children and their children and so forth. And um, it's not an easy, it's, it's never an easy answer and it's not going to be an easy answer, but that shouldn't, that shouldn't stop us from trying to find many answers. Permaculture is not just one answer, right? It's not like one plan. It's like there's going to be many different models. So, yeah. You want to open up that?